Hello everyone and welcome to the next edition of the Excel webinar series. My name is Rosan Apostolov and I'll be today's host. This webinar series are brought to you by BioXL, the leading European center of excellence for computational biomolecular research. In this series, we feature notable scientists and their work in the domain of uh, biomolecular sciences. We feature developers of popular software applications, new re release tools, which we believe might be of interest for the community, as well as educational webinars for those of you who are new to the field. And last but not least, we present sometimes uh, some of the major achievements of the work done in our center. We hope that these series are of interest and bring value to your work. And if you'd like us to invite specific speakers, or if you'd like us to feature given topics, uh, please get in touch with us and we'll be happy to organize them. For more information and contacts, please visit uh, www.bioxcel.eu. Before we begin, I have to tell you that this webinar is being recorded and after it's finished, we will put a recording on the YouTube channel of Bioxcel and also on the website which is very useful for those of you who couldn't make it to the live event today and you can also share it with your friends and colleagues. At the end of the presentation today we will have a question and answer session. For that at any time during the presentation today please feel free to use the questions tab on your GoToWebinar control panel. At the end of the talk I will give you the opportunity to ask your question directly. Uh, if there is problem with the audio, I will then read the question on your behalf. If you have some other questions or you're watching a recording of this session, please visit s.bioxcel.eu and post your questions there in the relevant discussion forum. With that, I'd like to present today's presenter this is Karsten Kutzner from Max Planck Institute for Biophysical Chemistry. Karsten studied physics at the University of Göttingen and in his PhD he focused on simulations of the Earth's magnetic field, which brought him in contact with high performance and parallel computing. Then he stayed at MPI for solar system research and eventually moved to computational biophysics. Since 2004, he's been working at the Max Planck Institute for Biophysical Chemistry in the group of Helmut Grubmüller. His interests are in, the, in method development, high performance computing, and atomistic biomolecular simulations. Those of you who follow the development of Gromos are uh, probably familiar with a lot of uh, Karsten's uh, work. And you can find him on Twitter at uh, Kuzner Karsten and also at the ComBioFIS tag. You can visit his web page as well. So with that, I'd like to welcome Karsten to tell us about his talk today. And uh, just uh, okay. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. I hope you can hear me well. Um, it's nice to have so many people interested in uh, what is the optimal hardware for uh, Gromex molecular dynamic simulations. So um, I'm going to start right with our motivation. So like many other MD groups worldwide probably, I should say, uh, we want to uh, find optimal hardware to run Gromex simulations uh, on them. Uh, so um, many groups have a have a, a fixed budget to buy small to medium uh, own clusters, and of course you want to make optimal use of that budget. Um, so in our case, and probably in many other cases as well, so we run mostly Gromex, uh, uh, the Gromex software on our cluster. So we can really tailor the nodes for for Gromex. So our strategy is to maximize cost efficiency by specialization. Um, and which is what is probably also quite often the case, our queue is always full. So we really optimize uh, the, the hardware for throughput and for single node performance. 
and if um, people want uh, to do strong scaling or have the smallest time to solution for a single uh, simulation or so then we ask them to go to the HPC centers which are very well equipped for that type of usage um, yeah so the the overall question uh, is stated here so given a fixed budget how can we actually produce as much MD trajectory as possible from that um, okay I will give a quick outline so um, this is an ongoing um, uh, investigation um, so already uh, um, a few years uh, uh, ago we did uh, uh, um, a similar um, um, a paper about um, what is the optimal hardware for Gromex 4.6 and um, we're gonna in, in this talk we're gonna quickly uh, recap what were our conclusions uh, back then a few years ago and we're gonna look at uh, both hardware and software de development uh, during the last uh, four or five years and what the impact uh, is on the hardware choices that one would make today um, so we've also uh, written up uh, recently our findings and an update to the original uh, paper where you might uh, want to look up the details if you're interested okay so um, our approach is uh, um, actually quite simple so um, we assemble a, a bunch of uh, cpu types and gpu models um, and um, on on all of the different combinations of that we we uh, vary uh, we uh, benchmark uh, um, Gromex. So um, we look at um, nodes with just CPUs. Um, here's a few examples. So we look at AMD CPUs, for example, Ryzen and Epic. Uh, we use, uh, look at uh, Intel CPUs like Core i7 or Xeons, so between 4 and 20 cores. Um, we also plug in GPUs uh, up to 4 um, in, in a node. And we both look at um, consumer GPUs. Uh, mostly at these here in the in the green box and also at professional GPUs like uh, Tesla V100 or so and for all that we determine then the prices and the performances and the performance to price ratio um, I should, should say that we are not aiming at a comprehensive evaluation of all currently available hardware because that's far too much so we uh, just aim to uncover hardware with a good uh, performance to price ratio and if we already know that uh, certain components will be very expensive and uh, not going to lead to a good uh, performance to price ratio then we're not really assembling nodes uh, uh, from that and also we are not uh, looking at strong scaling so um, these are the two um, benchmark MD systems that we use for our investigation so there's one very typical MD system it's an 80,000 atom uh, the, um, system which is an aquaporine tetramer embedded in a uh, lipid uh, membrane surrounded by water and ions um, this is with a two femtosecond time step and it uses PME electrostatics and there's a a larger system this is a 2 million atom uh, ribosome benchmark so ribosome and solution also with PME and uh, this one uses a 4 femtosecond uh, time step so what what do we actually really want um, so these are our requirements to the hardware uh, sorted by importance so the, the, the most important criterion for us is a, is a high performance to price ratio but then we also uh, look at the energy consumption which should be uh, as low as possible and we also uh, like uh, want to have uh, low rack space requirements because rack space is uh, limited in almost any server room so we re require a packing density of at least uh, one GPU per unit of rack space yeah so if you have a, a 4U server with four GPUs inside that fits our criterion um, and we also like to have a reasonably high performance of each single simulation so that means uh, we, we uh, with our benchmarks we run one simulation per GPU on the GPU nodes or if we just have a CPU node then we run one simulation over the whole node of course we could get a higher uh, a trajectory output by running let's say uh, 20 simulations on a 20 core server but that's not a typical scenario I mean we want to have um, trajectory production rates that you can really work with 
Um, and actually, so this best resembles how the cluster then in the end is actually used. Um, let's quickly look at some, uh, uh, well, maybe boring details, but some details about the benchmarks. So I should say all is done with Gromex uh, version 2018 here. Um, we use uh, two combinations of uh, GCC and CUDA. Um, the older benchmarks have been done with, with an older GCC and CUDA combination. They were typically slower by two and a half percent, but we took that into account. Uh, so we re-normalized those so that we have really comparable results for all of the benchmarks that we did. Um, we chose the optimal uh, SIMD instruction for at compile time for all the CPUs that we were looking in, at. Uh, OpenMP is of course enabled um, on uh, uh, nodes with uh, multiple GPUs where we run multiple simulations. We use Intel MPI 2017. And uh, so uh, the important thing is that we all of the nodes are booted from a common software image. So on the software side, uh, they're really identical. Um, for the benchmarks, they typically run for a couple of minutes um, and we discard the first part of the run from the timing measurements where, uh, let's say, effects like uh, memory allocation or load balancing uh, will still lead to a, a lower than average performance. Um, so the performance that we get uh, is really more or less the end performance. If you, if you let them run longer, you will see the same performance results. One important thing, so on multi-GPU nodes, um, the benchmarks used one simulation per GPU via the Gromex Multidia. Um, uh, command line switch, and we report the node performance as the sum of the performances of the individual simulations. We call that the aggregate performance. So if we have four simulations producing trajectory at the same time on a four GPU node, then of course the aggregate performance is the sum of the four individual performances. Um, okay, let's quickly look at the main result of the 2014 uh, hardware evaluation. Um, maybe I should spend a minute or so to explain these plots that we see quite often in the remainder of the talk. So this is a log-log plot. It shows the um, simulation performance on the x-axis as in it shows the total hardware costs on the y-axis. So um, this is for the membrane uh, benchmark system here and we see results for um, three different types of nodes. So the yellow uh, circles show results uh, from just CPU nodes. Um, the green ones are nodes with consumer GPUs and the um, um, magenta ones are nodes with uh, uh, professional Tesla GPUs. And an important feature are these uh, white lines here. So, so these are ISO lines of, of, of uh, um, identical or equal performance to price. Yeah, so the performance to price ratio along this line is the same. And if we move from one line to the next, there's a factor of two in between them. And the best configurations with the highest performance to price ratio are found in the green region. And we see uh, that all the nodes with uh, um, consumer GPUs, so GeForce GPUs, uh, they are uh, um, among the best in performance surprise and they produce on average two to three times as much tra MD trajectory per invested euro compared to, to CPU nodes. Um, so um, let's now look at the hardware and software de developments during that uh, at time. So um, on the hardware side, mainly uh, so mainly developments on the, on the uh, GPU side have have taken place. Um, so uh, the the raw uh, floating single precision floating point based uh, GPU processing power has all has more or less tripled uh, during that time. Yeah. So you see the 2014 GPUs in black here, a few 2016 models here and 2018 models here, and the, and the professional Tesla and Quadro GPUs here in magenta. Um, so, but uh, in addition with, with other microarchitectural improvements that um, made GPUs better suited for general purpose compute, this led up to a six times uh, performance increase in the GPU kernel. So if we measure the throughput, uh, um, um, Grobex throughput uh, of, the, of the GPU kernels, so this is actually 
a, a very good indicator for the GPU performance in Gromex. So this uh, has seen a an, an six-fold increase over that time. So and why we see that the um, the raw performance and the um, um, the throughput is about com well comparable for for the strong um, strong uh, Tesla models and the G uh, consumer GPU models. When we now look at the prices, since the price tag is completely different, uh, we find out that the um, performance to price ratio is completely different. So the professional Tesla GPUs, they can compete with consumer GPUs in terms of performance, but they cannot compete in terms of performance to price. So there's a factor of 10 or so difference here in performance to price. Um, okay. Um, now let's look at the, the software developments or at, at least at the, these software developments that had a large impact on, on the Gromex performance. Um, for that, let's look at a, um, well, a very um, simple sketch of what happens during an MD time step. So um, we see uh, the, the length of the time step here uh, uh, indicated by the uh, black arrow and the different colored boxes are what, what typically happens in MD time step. So this is a serial time step, nothing is parallelized yet. So uh, usually you do some kind of, of pair search or neighbor searching first because you want to compute the interactions uh, of atoms that are within a, uh, some kind of cutoff radius uh, of another atom. So these are the short range non-bonded interactions. Um, so after neighbor searching, you have the neighbor list, you can compute the short range Coulomb and Van der Waals interactions. Um, then normally you have a treatment of the long range uh, part of the Coulomb uh, uh, potential and forces that, that is usually done by PME. Um, the, the bonded forces have to be calculated and once all these uh, interactions have been calculated, the uh, velocities and the positions can be updated. Um, since uh, Gromex version 4.6, uh, there is the possibility to offload this blue box, the, the short range non-bonded forces to uh, a GPU. And by that, the, the length of the time step is uh, significantly re reduced and, and thereby, of course, the performance is, is uh, a lot higher. And so the, the only thing that, that you have to pay extra uh, to be able to do that offloading is to have some communication between CPU and GPU, which is uh, symbolized by the gray boxes here. So you need to send the positions of the atoms to the GPU. And uh, when the GPU is finished with its calculations, it uh, sends back the forces to the CPU, which can then do the update. Um, so there's uh, two important features for the uh, for higher performance uh, with GPUs in, in 2018. Uh, one is uh, dual pair lists with, dynam with dynamic pruning and the other is a PME offloading. So let's first look at the dual pair lists. What does that mean? So during, during pair search, um, you determine all the neighbors of an atom for which you need to calculate uh, the interactions. And uh, so you build a neighbor list and with a very simple neighbor list, you would have to um, or you would have to rebuild the neighbor list at every step because you don't know wh whether some of these atoms that are outside uh, the cutoff radius might have moved inside uh, during that integration step. This is of course a very naive way to do that. So um, what um, you usually do is you use a buffered um, pair list. So that means you add, if you, if you do neighbor searching anyhow, you add a small a buffer region for which you don't need to calculate the interactions yet, but if atoms move from the or, yeah move from the buffer region into the blue region here where you need to calculate the interactions, you already have them um, in the neighbor list. So that means you can do neighbor searching uh, far less often. So here, in fact, about uh, every 25 or 50 steps you need to do it, and. Uh, um, since version 2018, uh, the dual pair lists uh, were introduced, uh, which means you take that even one step further. So you now have a, um, an outer 
list, which is the light green one here, and an inner list, which is the green one. And um, so you only every very infrequently build the outer list from all of the atoms, and uh, you build the inner neighbor list from the outer neighbor list. Um, and that means you get lifetimes uh, for the outer list of 100 to 200 steps and lifetimes of 5 to 15 steps for the for the inner list. Um, yeah, you don't get extra interactions to calculate because you uh, dynamically prune um, um, everything which is outside of your list, which you already know what you don't need to calculate. So um, there's there's by building these these lists so uh, less often, the, the time step is significantly reduced. So the average time that you spend in in pair search per step is a lot shorter, and this this uh, pruning to get from the outer list to the inner list with GPUs this is actually for free um, because it can happen uh, at the time when the CPU is anyhow uh, doing the update. Um, so this is uh, do, uh, do, happening during a time when the CPU has uh, when the GPU uh, would be idle anyhow. Um, the other uh, important feature of, of Gromix 2018 is the possibility to also now offload the PME uh, calculations to a CUDA enabled GPU and thereby again uh, uh, significantly uh, uh, reducing the time step if a strong GPU is present. So um, with PME offloading you have very much less uh, compute demand on the CPU side. Um, and um, the optimal hardware balance has shifted even more towards the GPU. And this, uh, as we'll see, will enable um, higher performance to price ratios um, if you use cheap GPUs. Um, let's quickly look at the evolution of the Gromex performance across the releases from 4.6 to 2018 um, on GPU nodes. So let's... Uh, Let's take a typical case here with a JetX uh, 1080 GPU, and we see that over the releases, the Gromex performance has more or less continually increased, but we see uh, 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 the most pronounced increase in performance uh, when PME offloading uh, is actually switched on. So the, the blue and the black one are both Gromex 2018. Uh, the blue one, uh, calculates PME on the CPU and the black one calculates uh, PME on the GPU. And here with a strong GPU, you see an almost a factor of uh, a two uh, gain in performance. Um, another effect is that uh, of this PME offloading, if you look at the performance as a function of CPU cores per GPU, so uh, here we see the uh, number of cores. Um, Let's just look at the left plot, which is the membrane benchmark. The, the ribosome benchmark is very similar. Um, uh, so we see um, the, uh, um, the two cases. So the, the dashed lines is when CPU runs, uh, when PME runs on the CPU, and the solid lines is when when um, PME runs on the GPU. And there's only uh, uh, one case here uh, when it's actually faster to run PME on the CPU, and that is if you have a very strong uh, uh, CPU yeah, with, with uh, 16 cores uh, or 32 threads, it's uh, slightly faster to run uh, PME on the CPU, but in all other cases it's faster to run uh, uh, PME on the GPU. And you see that uh, you if you just if you don't aim for the maximum performance on a node that you can get, but just at the uh, let's say at eighty percent or so of the maximum performance, you see that you with PME offloading you you uh, need far less cores in this case about four to six cores to reach more than eighty percent of peak performance. Yeah, and um, that means that um, you could translate that um, into that about 10 to 15 core gigahertz suffice with a mid to high end GPU. Uh, so these are um, CPU co uh, cores times 
uh, uh, CPU frequency. Um, so why you would ask? Okay, why 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 stay in this yellow region? Yeah, 10 to 15 core gigahertz. Uh, why not move over to the right? The performance is higher there. Um, yeah, but now imagine you have a, uh, you have a workstation with uh, eight cores and uh, 1080 uh, um, GPU here, and now you want to uh, invest some money and and uh, somehow get to some to, to a higher performance. What you could do is you could uh, just buy a second um, CPU. So more CPU cores, double the amount, the number of CPU cores, then you would move uh, along the red line here, but you would only get a slightly higher performance out of that. Um, what you could, however, also do is you would invest the money in a stronger GPU. This would instantly give you uh, um, this amount of, of higher performance. But what you could also do is, uh, you just buy a second GPU, plug it in, and you would for a single oops, uh, sorry for a single simulation you would move along the um, green line here, but you would get an aggregate performance of two times that simulation performance. So altogether with the second GPU, uh, you um, get the highest aggregate performance from that node here. Um, so um, yeah, it's better to uh, uh, actually stay uh, in, in this range because it's simply uh, um, from a performance to price um, point uh, you'll get more out if you run uh, each simulation with just a couple of CPU cores instead of uh, lots of CPU cores. Um, so um, here we're looking at the uh, um, main result of our current investigation. So this is the performance in relation to the node costs. Um, I understand that this is a quite a complicated plot, but we're gonna uh, walk through that and um, look at, at uh, the uh, individual features one at a time. So what, what do we see here? We see, again, performance uh, on the x-axis, node costs on the y-axis, again, ISO lines of, of um, equal performance to price, so the best configurations are in the lower right corner, and we see the uh, two benchmarks now. So this is the, the results of the ribosome benchmarks, these are the stars, and the circles are the results of the membrane benchmark. Um, so um, the highest per node performance uh, we, we find for um, this high-end Intel CPUs combined um, with um, NVIDIA's uh, top-end uh, GPUs, the, the V100. However, if we look at the performance to price ratio, so if we follow these gray lines down here, this is only slightly better uh, as uh, CPU nodes. So the CPU nodes are the open symbols here. If we look at um, nodes with consumer GPUs that are the filled symbols, they have a way higher uh, um, performance to price ratio. So, and since, uh, I mean, all of the configurations down here with the consumer GPUs, they are uh, way cheaper than just a single uh, Tesla V100 GPU, yeah? So, we're going to cut for now the, uh, the plot about here and just look at the um, configurations with um, consumer GPUs. So, that looks like this now. Um, we might now ask, okay, what is now the, the performance to price ratio of consumer GPU nodes with respect to, to CPU nodes? Um, this depends a bit on, on actually the configuration, if you put in two or four uh, GPUs, but the factors um, range between three times better uh, up to seven times better here in this case for the EPIC with four GPUs. Um, so there is a huge gap in performance to price between CPU nodes and consumer GPU nodes. Um, okay, what are the best or what what which configurations um, give the best um, performance to price ratios? Um, there's quite a few of them, so um, but I've highlighted a, a couple of them here. Um, so both for the MEM benchmark as well as for the RIP benchmark. 
So for example, a 10 core Intel or a 60 core AMD Ryzen paired with two up to four uh, uh, top end uh, consumer GPUs uh, will give you uh, the, the optimal uh, performance to price ratio or you can get also similar performance to price ratios but for a lower investment by pairing a four core Intel node uh, with the two uh, G RTX 2080 for example that would, would be here but these are just a few examples um, so if we now compare that with uh, with Gromex um, 4.6, then we see that the gap has actually widened a lot. So I mean the gap between the CPU nodes and the consumer GPU nodes. So this used to be a factor of two to three uh, for Gromex 4.6, and now with PME offloading and the other features, it has gotten to a factor of three to seven with Gromex 2018. Um, another possibility that we have now, so due to the shift from CPU computing to GPU computing, um, we can actually upgrade old nodes that we still have with recent GPUs. And I've uh, put one example here. So this is an old uh, four core um, Intel uh, node where we used to run a GTX uh, 680 in them and we would get a benchmark performance of 27 nanoseconds a day. If we now plug in an RTX 2018, we get a factor of 3.4 uh, times higher performance. So this is the light uh, green node here. And you see, uh, I mean, we, we keep the whole node, we just buy a new uh, GPU and the, the performance to price ratio is uh, still, it's, it's, it's uh, dramatically better than everything else here. Um, here's two other examples. So these are, um, um, two times 10 core Intel uh, machines and we plugged in either two uh, GPUs here, 1080 Ti's or 2018 or even four and you see that you get about the same um, performance to price ratio even at least a factor of two uh, or even three, four, five uh, higher than new nodes and from uh, even from if you look at the total performance then uh, also the, the total performances are not worse for these nodes. Yeah, they are they're actually, uh, in this case, even slightly higher than for this professional uh, node. Um, yeah, so to sum that up, so we get one leap uh, in performance to price when moving from CPU nodes to consumer GPU nodes. And we can get, if we have the possibility, another leap in performance to price by upgrading existing nodes with, uh, sorry, with um, um, current um, consumer GPUs. Um, okay, let's also now quickly look at the energy efficiency. So we looked at uh, um, raw node prices until now, and uh, now we're gonna add the energy costs to the bill. So here we see, um, an example of a, a few different uh, nodes and we see the, the costs of the individual components of the nodes. So the x-axis is the net costs in Euro. Um, for example, if we take this node, this is a 10 core node with a 2630 uh, um, CPU in it. So this is the price of the CPU. Then you add RAM, some disk, board, chassis, what, what, everything what you need. Um, and uh, in this case, a 1080 Ti uh, GPU. Um, here is an, an example of an AMD server. So we don't know the individual component prices, but the whole thing is, is costs, uh, uh, well, it's, 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 a, um, it's a complete price of the server and you can add, or we added uh, two or four uh, uh, GPUs. And now we measured the uh, energy consumption um, and so that we did while the ribosome benchmark uh, was running. And now we take into account um, of our costs for energy and cooling are about uh, 20 euro cents per kilowatt hour. Um, and so that you see now as these light blue or grayish uh, blocks. So this is, this is energy costs for each year. So if you operate this 
uh, configuration for one year, the total price would be nearly 8,000 euro. And if you operate it for another year, um, you would add up these one year blocks of energy. So we uh, chose about, or we, we calculate with five years of op operation. So after five years, um, the energy costs are actually uh, about uh, as high as the hardware costs or even higher. Yeah, so you um, have to pay more for energy and cooling than you invested originally in, in into the uh, hardware. Um, that we now um, put into relation to the um, performance of the ribosome benchmark for these um, different configurations, and then we end up with, uh, with a result like this. So we see for five years of operation, the total trajectory costs, um, including hardware and energy, in this case for the ribosome benchmark, and uh, the um, orange part is the hardware part, and the gray part uh, is the energy part. And um, yeah, I've um, for comparison, I've also put the old results here. So these are old nodes uh, tested with Gromex 4.6 from our old investigation. And uh, in the middle region here, these are newer nodes uh, with, with Gromex 2018. Um, one, um, one thing to note is that if we uh, look at nodes with just CPUs, so these are uh, these four here, um, they have the highest trajectory uh, production costs, regardless of whether we use uh, Gromex 4.6 or 2018. And we can now uh, ask, okay, how much cheaper can we produce trajectory if we plug in GPUs? And this used to be a factor of uh, 0.6 for Gromex 4.6. So if I plug in 17080 Ti here, then I produce trajectory for about 60% of the costs uh, of uh, running without a GPU, um, but for Gromex 2018, this is, uh, has, has uh, gone down to about uh, 0.3 or 0.4. So GPU nodes also uh, uh, produce trajectory a lot cheaper than, than uh, CPU nodes. Um, so the lowest, lowest part here, the lowest three configurations are actually uh, GPU upgrades, so these are old nodes. These are the same nodes that we benchmarked in the old investigation. And we simply plugged in, we ripped out the old uh, GPUs, we plugged in new GPUs. Um, so the uh, hardware price uh, part just reflects the price of the GPUs. And But we also see that uh, also from, from an energy point of view, they are not uh, um, I mean, not using uh, more energy or so uh, as as the uh, the other uh, new configuration. So even uh, these upgrades are also uh, uh, good to do if you're including the energy cost. So these are actually uh, this these are the configurations that produce um, trajectory at the yeah for the for the least amount of money. Um, yeah. So um, that's what I wanted to, to say. So to conclude, um, if you decide to buy new nodes, um, then in general, consumer GPU nodes have a much higher performance to price ratio um, than CPU nodes. And if you look at the raw node price, this used to be a factor of three, two to three for older Gromex versions. And now it has grown to a factor of three to seven for Gromex 2018. And if you include energy costs, then still, uh, consumer GPU nodes are about three times better in performance to price than CPU nodes. Um, if you can, what is even better uh, is uh, uh, recycling old nodes. So we saw as a result of this um, work shifting towards the GPU, um, often there's it's it's not even needed to upgrade the CPU part of a node. Yeah. So, but if you upgrade this, the GPU, this uh, uh, yields uh, large performance increases. Um, we saw that the optimal hardware balance is about, uh, as a rule of thumb, of 15 core gigahertz per uh, 2080 or similar GPU. And I should also say that the, all of these results, they should vary 
uh, well transferred to the newer GROMEX version 2019. Um, so there um, you also oops, have the possibility to uh, also offload the bonded interactions to a CUDA enabled GPU, which will move the hardware balance even slightly more towards the GPU. And uh, uh, 2019 will also offer um, PME offloading with OpenCL. So that means you can also use it together with um, AMD um, GPUs. Um, there's some additional material I wanted to point out. Uh, so if you want to do your own benchmarks, um, we put our input files uh, on this web page here. So you can test with your own hardware if you like. And um, yeah, these are just the mentioned publications. There's also a summary poster um, about um, the investigation. And with that, I want to thank uh, the Department of Theoretical and Computational Biophysics um, in Göttingen. Um, I would also th like to thank the, the organizers, uh, BioExcel, um, and also for funding uh, with uh, SPPXA. Um, and uh, also, I'd like to thank uh, Markus and Hermann from the Max Planck Computing and Data Facility, uh, who also helped a lot with uh, uh, recycling um, nodes. Yeah, um, thank you all for your interest, and um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Karsten. It was a very interesting talk. A great follow up on your previous work. Uh, we have a question by Horacio. Let's see if we can have an audio link. Uh, Horacio, can you hear us? Hello? Yes, we hear yes. you. Yeah, I, it was uh, during the explanation of this uh, dual air list uh, with dynamic running. Uh, yeah. I, I was wondering if this is just a uh, uh, tuning the skin uh, length uh, at the end, but uh, I think there is another functionality because it uh, at the end you explained something with the GPUs. I, I didn't really really understood, but uh, this the, this dual um, um, lists are interacting with each other. Uh, so I mean, it's 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 so basically the idea is uh, that you um, have in inner list and you don't need to build the inner list again all of the time from all the atomic positions of the whole system but you just build the inner list from the outer list so this is far faster um, plus you can do it uh, on on the gpu while you while the cpu does the update and so the main effect that you see is that you do the pair searching uh, a lot less often so you you only do it every 100 to 200 steps uh, that is indicated by the smaller green pair search box uh, in this picture C compared to the to the B picture where you need to rebuild the list every 25 or so steps. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you, you yeah. want to do this pair searching as less often as possible. That's the idea. Okay, but, but if you uh, at the beginning of the simulation just tune the skin, uh, let this buffer uh, length it wouldn't be like a similar effect. Um, so, uh, well, um, it depends. I mean, you mean you would just from the from the very beginning you would use a very large buffer, right? Uh, yeah, I mean to tune the buffer to the to the physics underneath uh, or the system you are you are tackling, right? I mean it depends also on the system at the end. I mean the buffer you need anyhow, so you don't miss an, an interaction. Uh, the, the question is how big is the buffer, and yeah. um, uh, so you you don't want to. I mean. So this this goes uh, with volume, right? So if you make the buffer a little bit larger, then you suddenly have a lot of atoms uh, more in in your neighbor list, and theref therefore it's uh, important to have this this pruning that you frequently reduce from this uh, outer list to an inner list, which is which is then actually smaller because you don't want to um, run or or compute all the interactions of the outer list. That would be far too many. 
Okay, you know, no, I, I, I get the idea. So it, it's, uh, I think it's more uh, a, a bit maybe this tuning scheme uh, length procedure, but on top of that, the, the pruning part is the, the dynamic pruning part. It's the, what, what you explained that it's uh, making it more efficient, let's say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, no, I, I got it. Thank you. Okay. Okay, uh, then we have a question by Gaia. Just a second. So, Gaia, do we hear each other? Yes. Can you? Uh, it's very faint, your voice. Can you speak louder and maybe closer to the microphone? Okay, now? Oh. Better? Yes, yes. okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, first of all, uh, thanks for the seminar. Uh, then I have a question about, uh, I mean, uh, these results are uh, for a single precision. Sorry for the, Hello? Like the benchmark that you show, uh, for yeah. Gramax compiled in single uh, precision? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or okay. mixed precision, as we say, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, that, uh, do you think that, um, uh, do they change if you compile Gramax in double? Oh, okay, if you, like if you need to run, months, like, yeah. Yeah, so if you really need to run Gromax in double precision, uh, in contrast to mixed precision, then you, I mean, yeah, basically you need to run on, on a CPU. So you, there's, ah, okay, there's no okay, version so yet you, that runs. Sure. Okay, I see. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it was also with the old, old version. Okay, so it's still uh, double. That's precision. still the case. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I would encourage everyone to use the control panel to ask questions, as uh, it's shown on the slide here. Rossum? Yes. Arno here. So although I cannot type in a question, I have a question that I would like to ask. Yes, please um, go ahead. So, uh, so Karsten, the uh, yeah. multi-TPU results that you present, uh, get the performance figure for multi-TPU nodes by aggregating uh, the figures for a single simulation running on each GPU. How do you think that the results would differ if you were to do um, single simulation multi-gpu um so there's there's yeah there's two effects here so one effect is that um uh, you, so pme at the moment can just run on a single gpu so um you are uh, sometimes you're a little bit limited in scaling across a whole node if you have many many gpus because uh, the all the pme interactions have to run on one of the gpus for the moment um and so that that's one effect and the other effect is that you yeah i mean you lose you're, you're losing uh, uh or you you're lower with parallel efficiency anyhow if you if you scale across more cpu cores and, and more gpus so if you do that the uh, the performance to price ratio will of course be um worse for these configurations and so in fact so our motivation for for um testing one simulation or for benchmarking one simulation per gpu is actually that we didn't want to penalize uh, hardware or let's say you have you have a node with with a specific cpu and one gpu and you get a benchmark result and a performance to price ratio and now suddenly there's another vendor who sells the same thing but just uh, it, he puts two cpus and two gpus of the same type on a single node yeah if we now benchmark one uh, simulation per GPU, we get exactly the same performances per uh, um, simulation and the same performance to price ratio. If the price is two times of that of the of the uh, single simple node, but if we then suddenly benchmark one simulation across the doubled hardware, we will also see a reduced uh, um, um, performance to price ratio, yeah, because we get 
we have the, the, the loss and parallel efficiency and all that. And we didn't want that because we didn't want to, to penalize the, the aggregation of, uh, of hardware because that's actually what we want. We, we want to have as dense hardware as possible in, in our compute center. Does that make sense? Yes, that makes sense. Thanks very much. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we have a question by RK. Um, let's see. Okay. Uh, so actually, he's just congratulating uh, Karsten and the whole crew on helping us getting the biggest bang for our bucks since 2014 original article. Super helpful. <laughs> Thank so, you. <laughs> this is feedback to you, Karsten. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, he doesn't have a microphone, he can't uh, say it. Um, so we don't have other questions, but uh, well, I guess uh, we can expect another update on the work in four years' time or something. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> See what new hardware uh, comes up and what new algorithms Gromax implements uh, to utilize them better. Um, yeah, watch our webpage. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and we will definitely do a follow-up webinar on it. So, um, Kasten, can you show the next slide? Yeah, sure. Thanks. So, uh, with this, we will finish uh, today's presentation, and I would like to remind those of you who are interested in enhancing their molecular simulations with uh, additional functionality. Um, some of you already know about one popular plugin called Plunt. And uh, we have the pleasure to host uh, one of the developers presenting it uh, next week in our BioXA webinar series. It will be also on Thursday from uh, 3 p.m. So you can register for the webinar in the, the same way as you registered for this one. And uh, we look forward to meet you then. So thank you again, everyone, for attending. And thanks, Karsten, again for the great work. Yeah, thank, you. thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Bye. Have a nice day. Goodbye. 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 Thanks.